Ronnie Kosher live stream. Hey folks, it's Matt at Pranakasha Productions, and today we are talking with Alec Keith, a talented flutist and musician in the Seattle area, who I happen to know from playing a lot of gigs together, and also he took lessons from my mom when he was a kid, but back then it was violin lessons, right? It was, yeah, violin lessons, and then when I got to, uh, when I was 11 years old and beginning band, I was able to switch over to flute, and uh, yeah, I went to the dark side, as it were, so yeah. Oh, the dark, fluffy side. <laughs> <laughs> so when you did, you so you did Suzuki violin then, mm-hmm. when you were, I think you were six when you started, until you were about 12 years old or something? Yeah, like five years old to about 11 or so, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Thanks. And even though I didn't get, go on to keep doing violin, I got to say, I feel like the Suzuki training that I got from your mom really helped me out a lot with developing my ear um, and a lot of just little musicianship kind of stuff like that. So really owe her a lot for helping me get to where I am now. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> well, I do remember when I was a kid, uh, the very first orchestra I played in when I was in kindergarten, I think it was there was like a a school junior symphony and I was in the first violins and I couldn't read any music to save my life because I just learned everything by ear yeah and I was sort of in the back of the first and we were playing a piece and I realized that the flutes were basically playing the same thing as us so I just listened to the flutes and tried to copy everything they did (laughs) oh good yeah (laughs) it kind of (laughs) worked and it was one of those um junior symphony type of situations where there was like 10 flutes you know, mm-hmm. rather than your usual two that you usually have in a in a grown up orchestra. <clears throat> Big boys, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um I should mention another thing that we're about to do. We're gonna do a Raga concert on Saturday, October first. And it's gonna be Raga is taught at the Ali Akbar College of Music, and it's in um celebration of the life of Ali Akbar. And it's at the Bellevue Youth Theater at 6 p.m. Saturday, August 1st. And this is put on by our friend Russell, Richard Russell, who's the Sirode player in the group and the music director. And then we're going to also have an incredible tabla player whose name is Supratik Chatterjee on tabla. And then Alec Keith right here on flute. And Soham Ratnaparki on vocals. Also, uh, Deepa Joklekar on harmonium, though we haven't actually rehearsed with her yet. No. So, but that's going to happen soon. And then we have another vocalist, which is Yogesh, Yogesh Ratnaparki, which is actually Soham's dad. So it's a father and son on the vocals. And then we have a sitar player whose name is Samapata Bararo. And then Matt Weiss, that's me, a.k.a. Pranakasha Matt, on viola. And then also a friend of mine that I've known for a long time who actually played in the Octava Chamber Orchestra way back when, when we first formed the group. Um, and the Octava Chamber Orchestra is an orchestra that both Alec and I play in. And um, that was Dennis Taskowski on bass. So quite an assortment of players. So you got about half of the group are seasoned Indian classical musicians. And the other half of the group are people like me and Alec who are basically Western trained and then um, trying to do our best playing, playing along with Indian Raga. So we're kind of newbies at the Indian Raga thing. But um, the reason that this concert even works is because um, <clears throat> The music director uh, plays both Western and Eastern music, and he wrote the whole thing out in standard notation for us. So we have it all written down and we have sheet music for it. So we can read the sheet music and then for the stuff that you can't really uh, notate that well, he just teaches us real quick how to do it. So it's gonna be really cool. It's really fun. I'm totally loving it. So be sure to check out that concert. We'll put a link down there too. 
so you guys can follow us as the day approaches for that. Um, also, I found out that Alec, besides being a classical flutist, you told me that you also do a lot of Irish flute and stuff like that, too. Yep, sure do. Um, around the same time, I started learning classical flute when I was 11 years old. Um, we had a lot of Irish music playing on the stereo and speakers around the house. My dad really liked that music um, and mom was into it, too. So we had a lot of Chieftain CDs. Um, it's kind of like big Irish band. Outtan's another really big Irish band. I draw a lot of inspiration from them. Okay. Um, the flute player in that group uh, named Frankie Kennedy, he unfortunately died in about like 1994, I want to say. But just like mm. every time I hear that sound, that's like the sound that I want to go for. Um, he's like my favorite Irish flute player of all time. So oh. when I was 11 and started learning classical uh, flute, my dad also gave me an Irish tin whistle. So I started playing along with the CD recordings that we had around the house. And again, that Suzuki training that I got from um, Mrs. Nix, that really helped me out a lot because got used to playing by ear, learning music that way. So I was able to uh, take the that and use it to learn to play Irish music on the tin whistle that my guy, dad gave me. Um, and then there was a family at the church I grew up going to, Faith Lutheran Church. They, oh, Faith they, Lutheran. I, yes. We, you um, know, we did a couple of Octava concerts there early uh, on, cool. too. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. that's cool. Yeah, so uh, we had a family there that played Irish music. So after uh, church services on Sunday, uh, get together with them and we'd sit down in the social hall and play Irish music. Wow. Um, yep. And then the uh, the fingering for Irish flute is pretty much essentially the same as tin whistle. So it's pretty easy to just switch over to playing that sideways wooden flute for that. Oh, cool. <clears throat> oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Well, we're, uh, we're going to get some demonstrations of that later on, right? Okay. Oh, cool. yeah. I brought one right, got one with me right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe we should do it now. Let's hear, let's hear what we got. Okay, so sure. that's a wooden flute, right? Uh, this one's actually made out of a uh, polymer Delrin kind of stuff. Um, I've got a couple of wood instruments. Um, this is a nice one, also a very good mellow instrument. Um, so it's got the open holes right here. And this thing's actually based off of like an 18th century, what well, the kind of flute that they would have used in like the 17 or 1800s. Um, I'd have to double check whereabouts. Uh, you mean just a classical but, transverse flute from that t time period? Yep. Okay. And what happened is uh, when Theobald Baim, the, uh, the inventor of the modern system for uh, flute fingering, the modern key work on flute, that came out, there were a lot of bees lying around. And since, um, you know, the fingering system was the same as um, Irish bagpipes, uh, Eland pipes and tin whistle, um, a lot of Irish flutists, you know, managed to find old versions of bees lying around. And so they uh, they just started playing that for Irish music. So that's how cool. it got through the tradition. Um, the open holes are the main ones that we use. That's where you get the best ornamentation. You know, if one of the first things people think about with Irish music is the ornamentation. Um, and so the reason why people like to keep using these kinds of instruments instead of silver classical flutes is because the keys aren't in the way um, of that ornamentation. So if there's a tonal difference, of course, a timbre difference, but um, the keys kind of get in the way of the of some of the ornamentation you want to do. So I'll, if this has keys on it, that's just for like occasional passing tones between notes. Um, but just having the open hole system really makes it so much more ideal for okay. getting the style that you want to get. Okay. Yeah, let's hear it. Sure, sure. How does that sound on the speaker? Is it not, it's not cutting out or anything? Or Well... It's not the greatest, but okay. So, folks, like we, we don't have a super good sound system, so yeah. you got to just imagine it sounds really good. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Cool. 
Cool. Thanks. So that yeah, was your... That sounded pretty good. The Zoom, Zoom didn't like the high notes too much. It's, it's already cut out for that. But That's So great. you were doing some of the ornamentation that you were talking about doing that little lick, right? Yes. Can you show um, us I... like what, so what is it about the holes that, that let you to do that? Sure. So the Irish flute comes, um, you know, it's the fingering is really similar to traditional Irish bagpipe. Um, Irish bagpipe is different from the Scottish one. We usually think about, uh, for those who don't know, the Scottish one's got like that part that you blow into and then you squeeze the bag. Um, Irish pipes have um, a bellows that you put under your arm and then the bag sits on the other side. So you're using the bellows um, to get the keep the bag inflated uh, on one oh. hand and then the other hand's pushing the uh, air through the chanter and the reeds and stuff. Um, so bagpipes, you know, you can't do any tonguing, right? So uh, they came up with this fingering stuff. The ornaments were, were meant to be replicate a kind of tonguing sound and break up the uh, the phrasing and make it so that um, that way you're creating phrases since you can't do it with your tongue. It's just one continuous long airflow. Uh, right. So you use the fingers to create the uh, phrasing. So people think of like the Irish flute ornamentation, they call it an ornamentation, but really a better uh, term for it would be fingered articulation because you're using your fingers to create phrasing um, in a tonguing sort of like imitation. So like a classical player would play something like this. And use the tongue to start each that was six eight they'd use their tongue to start each of the uh three eighth note patterns right okay instead an irish player would do something like this i tried staying in the lower register so that way you could hear it better yeah but, um, uh, so what you're doing is you're just ever so quickly lifting and replacing finger right here or uh, on different notes. So that way you're creating that sort of phrasing in it. And you can do that by lifting just like that. You can also slap the, uh, the open hole really quick. Okay. So when yep. you were first trying to figure out how to do this, did you, how did you find find out that that's how they did it? I mean, did you there was no videos back then, right? No, nope. this was before uh, you know, before YouTube was really a widespread thing if it even existed yet at that time. Okay. Uh, but we had a uh, but again that Irish family, that family at my church that played Irish music, they taught me um how to do that kind of stuff. Um, okay. They didn't break it down quite the same way that uh, I just did for you, but he showed me that the, the um, father of the family, he played flute. And so he showed me like some of that ornamentation or some of that uh, quick finger movement stuff. Okay. And then because he showed me that and because I was listening to it a locker up with it, I was able to um, understand what kind of sound to go for for that. Um, when I went off to college, college i stopped playing irish music the first time i went to college i stopped playing irish music for most of the time i was there um at least on like whistle and irish flute i would uh still play folk melodies and stuff like that on my silver flute as okay. like part of warm-up exercises and stuff like that um but then when i got done got done with college moved back to seattle i wanted to be take it more seriously than I had been before um and so i found the book that the um family was using called the essential guide to irish flute and tin whistle i have it right here oh cool yeah right here this is the book this is kind of, yeah oh so nice this really, uh, so this does a great job of delineating and telling you um more about that ornamentation stuff um the finger you know he's the one that describes it as being a fingered articulation system okay and um i had picked up a few fingering things from that family at the church but that book really helped me uh it, it gives you like the most optimum ones like it tells you okay if you're gonna do um that finger flick on the g we call it a cut you know use this finger right here for that 
Okay. Um, and went a little bit more in depth on that. So that was able to give me more of a um, better description of what to go for. And again, I grew up listening to the music. Um, so that was really helpful because I knew from what he was describing um, and then listening to the music and other flute and other flute recordings, I was able to pick up on what to go for. Okay. okay I'm do that with my fingers. Make sure it's like super quick. So I'm doing that, 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 that kind of sound. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So, I mean, so originally it was just a way to sort of show where the phrase was, but then of course it's also a nice little ornament. Mm -hmm. So it sounds really cool. It, you know? Yeah, it helps. It helps you create, you know, and you can you do all sorts of things on it. It's like if you're maybe instead of like playing between those, you can go. In Irish music, when you play a tune with um, other musicians, generally you're playing the same tune um, approximately about three times in a row. So you can use those um, ornaments and stuff to change what you're doing on subsequent run throughs and stuff like that. Okay. Um, oftentimes when I'm playing um, at a session with other Irish musicians, um, I like to watch the fiddle players and see what they're doing with their bows and um, just some stuff they're doing with their fingerings and then change how I'm ornamenting based on what their bows are doing and stuff like that. If I see them leaning into a note, maybe I'll kind of lean into the note too um just little little things like that so yeah it, it helps with that phrasing stuff but you can also use it to give new inflections on the music um the next time through because again you're playing a tune like three times in a row uh, mostly okay. so that helps you create yeah new little nuances to it that's cool and of course that's what gives it that irish sound yeah okay can i ask you some violin questions though now because like since i'm also i'm a a violinist as well as a violist and cellist mm -hmm. um now i've never read a book but i try to i just try to wing it sometimes and like a lot of times when like i'm playing in the church band sometimes i'll try to do sort of an irish thing on a certain song Ooh. especially if we're doing like for example if we're doing a hymn mm -hmm. that i know the melody of the hymn is really some famous irish folk song yeah. then i'll try to do it in that style like the uh canticle of the turning right yeah, well, like, you know, the uh, well, what's the, uh, there's, there's, there's so many famous ones. Um, well, now I can't pull it out right now, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I don't even have a hymnal nearby, mm -hmm. I don't think. Da ta da 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 Oh. Yeah, because I think I think I studied. I might and I might be wrong on that. Um, but uh, I thought that's what I learned. Um, we 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 actually had that one at a class uh, voice um, series that I had up uh, over at Central Washington University. I think I read that in the description. But okay, are you able to toss that off on your flute? Yeah, I could do that one. Yeah, let's see how you do it. Oh, that's kind of higher register. Let's see. Unfortunately, Zoom hated us on that. <laughs> it was yeah. cutting in and out all over the place. Skull dang it. Zoom, Gosh, well. Zoom is designed for talking rather than music, so it always tends to screw it up. But we, we imagined how beautiful it was. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. 
I know what you're talking about, man. Yeah, um, I teach elementary when I was I teach elementary school music. We were on Zoom, and you know, I try to be teaching songs to my kids, and it's just such a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. So you've been now a music teacher in the Edmonds School District for three years now? Yep. Um, I started off as a parent educator um, at the school I am now. Um, it's uh, the, I saw the music teacher there and just I, I didn't grow up in a general music um, program at my elementary school. But mm -hmm. uh, I was able to see the teacher there and what he did and that inspired me to go back and get my music degree. That's cool. Um, yeah, so came back in now, uh, graduated just in time for uh, March 2020, you know, I got done in December 2019. Um, but yeah, uh, I managed to get a job there and uh, I'm in my third year now. That's cool. Do they still teach kids using those plastic recorders? Um, uh, you know, we did that the entire time I was a paraeducator there. Um, that's an option I could do. I chose not to do it last year because of COVID restrictions. They wanted us to put like a little bell cover over the bottom of them and stuff like that. Um, I'm just, I was like, man, and you had to like get paper masks and cut like a hole in the middle of them for the kids to put the recorders through and stuff. So I said I wasn't going to do that. Um, but now that we're back, we, uh, we have um, the COVID restrictions are a lot less. Um, now that the mask mandate's gone. So I'm thinking, you know, of course, you know, try and switch from recorder over to Irish tin whistle. I was going to say, what if he yeah. used a little t tin whistle? Yep. So yeah, then my, you'd be right uh, up your alley. That's one of my projects right now. I'm looking at uh, what kind of uh, grant money I can get. Thankfully, they're pretty cheap. They're only like 10 bucks. But uh, once okay. again, uh, yeah, then I'll be able to order a few sets for my classes. So that's cool. That. And they're just plastic, right? Uh, you can get plastic ones. You can get ones that are made out of real tin. Um, I've got a carbon fiber one. That's the main That's the main whistle I use when I do gigs. Okay. Uh, I've got an aluminum one. Um, the ones I'm looking at, um, I forget what material they're made out of uh, for my students, but they're only they might be real tin. They're only like ten bucks, so it won't be too it won't be too bad. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, do you have one of those nearby? Maybe we can hear that uh let me yeah if you give me like if you give me like one second let me uh let me turn off the um stop video take me like less than one minute La Croix. yeah so this right here is a whistle this is the same type i'm looking at for ordering for my classroom this is your ten dollar whistle okay. uh, great option for getting started you know if you're not quite ready to play flute yet you know you give one of these a go um, okay. Bucks and start teaching yourself those articulations. So that's um, basically just a, a metal tube with a couple of hole, some holes drilled in it and then like a plastic mouthpiece stuck on the end of it? Yep. Um, we call the mouthpiece a fipple. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, plastic fipple. Tin. No idea what type of uh, what type of metal it is. Probably just tin, whatever. Um, but yeah, and then six First holes deal. in there. Yep. Are they just... So the the original one, how did they make the mouthpiece? Was it originally wooden? Yeah, probably wooden. Um, I haven't seen like an old one. Um, I'd have to go back and look. But yeah, I imagine, imagine like wood piece or something like that. Um, okay. Yeah. And are the holes exactly, are they the same or are they sort of spaced a certain way? Oh, they're spaced a certain way. Like if you look closely, you'll see like these these two are closer together and then this one um the third one down's got more of a stretch to it and same thing right here you got these two holes and then way down here is that one not a big deal on whistle because uh you know it's uh small enough that your fingers are still going to be able to spread um, okay. flute can be a little bit flute can be a little bit more tricky like right here this is the one a lot of people um have a hard time with because you know you got to have your finger do this big stretch down there. Oh, okay. Uh, sometimes this one can be a little far for people also. Um, the cool thing is a lot of modern makers now um, will actually, you can usually, if you order one of these, you can get it, get one with the whole set lower down. Um, so that way you're just going like right there instead of stretching across the inside. Oh, okay. Yep. And they make ones like that down here also. Okay. And then, so the the flute that you have right now, that's chromatic, right? It can get all the twelve notes of the scale. Yep. Right. 
It sure can. Um, and it's actually just oboe fingering. Um, that was okay. kind of an eye opener for me. When, when you use these keys right here, it's basically um, oboe fingering. You got your E natural and then you use this one for an F natural. Um, you do this for F natural. Um, otherwise, oh, okay. you just finger it like a regular flute. It's going to sound F sharp. Um, so, uh, that's one difference between this and the silver flute. If you do the regular fingering, you would on a silver flute, you're going to get F sharp when you go finger an F, yeah. but yeah, so this is E, you just put down one of these keys. Um, this six one's handy if you're going from like D to F natural, cause you know, it's like you need to like, otherwise you're like leaping there and it just doesn't sound right. You got to okay. know yeah now, um, does a does a silver flute have a register key that'll knock you up an octave or how does it work on flute um no you gotta do um some fingerings are better than others there's not like one key that you press to jump that octave a lot of it's within um what you're doing with your embouchure and some air control stuff okay. um but yeah but and then there's different fingerings that optimize it to make it easier and give you a better more intense sound when you're up there so you basically um, just overblow it? Is that how you get up there? Yeah. Okay. Um, you do some overblowing, some lip embouchure stuff. Everyone's different. Um, okay. I was taught, you know, try to focus your embouchure more. But then I've got this book right here that was written by the guy that trained James Galway. So I guess he's okay. Uh, <laughs> it, wasn't written, it wasn't written by him, but it's a collection of like his teachings and his methods and stuff. And he insists that, that you should be trying to blow harder to get up to those other notes. So, you know, different, different ways. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. That's cool. All right. Yeah. So let's hear the penny whistle then. Let's hear what it can do. All right. We'll do our best with that, uh, you know, crummy Zoom call. Okay, we heard some of it. Oh, that was okay. cool. Now the Venetian blinds are attacking you again. No, we're getting All these right. stripes cross. <laughs> Better? Well, kind of. I don't know. Whoops. There we go. I've got my Irish flag. That's more topical anyway. Oh, there so. we go. Yeah, there we go. Irish flag. All right. Cool. Okay, that looks cool. So uh, the penny whistle is. It's not a chromatic instrument, right? It's diatonic. Totally diatonic. Um, okay. It's technically for us classical players, you know, we would say it's in the, you know, C because when you finger a D, it's going to sound a D. You finger a C, it's going to do C. But because um, it's because the main scale it plays in is D major, um, uh -huh. Irish musicians are going to call it a D whistle. Okay. Uh, so we call it a D whistle, even though it's in the same, uh, even though it's in concert pitch. Okay. Is that because yeah. Irish music tends to use a Dorian scale or something like that? Or tends to use D major, um, oh, okay. tends to use D major, G major, A major, um, and the, uh, Mixolydian versions of those. So D major, D major. Wait a sec. Yeah. D major has a C sharp and an F sharp and that you wouldn't have that in a C flute, right? D, um, so D majors, you got F sharp, and again, because it's a uh, diatonic, it does it naturally goes for an F sharp when you finger that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, okay. So, F sharp's the natural, not natural, F sharp's what it goes for when it, you do okay. that. So and then, when you do mixolydian, you can do this half length thing. This uh, this fingering right here gives you a C natural. It's a little bit muffled, um, but okay. it gives 
you know, you're just, yeah, put those two fingers down, you got your C natural. Um, G Mixolydian is going to be a little bit more of a challenge. You can half full, um, of course, uh, but that's really hard to do. Um, so that's the point where you might want to have like a few keys on your flute for doing. All right, now we're getting technical. So right, right. does your typical Irish uh, player, do they, when you call out these different modes like Mixolydian or Dorian or whatever, do they know what you're talking about? Mostly we call out tune names. Um, I mean, okay. some people, like, some people, we, there are quite a few people, you know, in town that have had formal, you know, like, music, written music lessons and stuff like that. And then other people, you know, they have it, but they know the tune and everything. And they can, you know, they'll they'll know what kind of sounds you're going for. Okay. Like that and everything. But, yeah. Um, it's not something you'd normally, you know... If you get together at a, your local pub for an Irish music session, get together, you're not typically talking about keys most of the time, but yeah, it's just, oh yeah, that tune followed by that tune. That sounds really good. That kind of thing. So, and then like when you're doing that, you, you'll pretty much stick to one, one whistle the whole time, or do you like have a few that you keep switching between depending on the key of the tune? Most guys I know, um, like, I mean, most guys I know will take a few whistles along that can play in different keys. I mean, Every once in a while, um, a tune in D minor will come up and then they'll, you know, you can take out your C whistle and play it as if it was in the key of E and then, you know, uh, you're getting that sound. So that way you don't have to, uh, that way you're able to play along. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, typically whenever I go out to play, I take along, um, I take a flute um, a D flute, you know, cause you know, it's the main scale. I take a D flute. Um, I'll take, um, and I'll take a D whistle just for adding some variety here, you know, during the course of the gig, you know, some stuff, it just sounds cooler when you have, it's nice to switch between the different instruments. Um, but I'll have stuff in different keys just in case, you know, uh, something comes up and it's like, as I mentioned, it's like, you got these keys for like passing through other notes and stuff like that. If you're playing, okay. if you're going to play in G minor, there's not very many tunes in G minor, but you know, it's like you're going to play in some odd key like that, or even in C, then I like to switch to a whistle. So that way it's easier um, on the fingers and less keys I'm relying on, the better I can do that ornamentation. That's cool. Do you ever find yourself wanting to whip out a violin? Oh, I'm sorry to tell you, Matt, but you know, I mean, <laughs> this, this was even, even before I started studying with your mom, I just have this vivid memory of when I was about four years old or so. Um, since both my parents were musicians, orchestra musicians, I just, I was able to hear the sound of a flute from a very young age and I just fell in love with it. Okay. Uh, never, never went back afterwards. As soon as I was able to switch to flute. Yeah. So I'm sorry. That was about it. That, but uh, yeah, it's a no fiddle. Flute, flute's <laughs> really my spirit. Yeah. It's my spirit instrument. That's the word. Okay. And yeah. uh, we keep talking about your parents. So your mom plays violin. Your mom's Rebecca Keith. She also plays an October chamber orchestra. Yep, yep. And then your dad plays trumpet. And he he actually played an octava a long time ago. I know he played trumpet when we did my clarinet concerto. Yes. And I think that was the only time. Or did he ever play again with us? Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't think he's done. Yeah, I can't. I can't for life of me think of any other uh, classical stuff he's done since that concert. I remember yeah. it very vividly because that was the first time I got to play in an orchestra with both my parents. Um, yeah, I was able to sit in on that one and just, yeah, I remember how fun it was to be on the same gig as them. So That's I played cool. with my mom a couple of, played with my mom a couple of times since then, but not as much with my dad, but yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he, he's one of the jazz guys. He's a uh, yeah jazz player. So That's all the family. family. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, you also play a little bit of piano, right? Is that true? No. Okay. Or does your dad? Uh, both my brothers took piano lessons. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Maybe that's yeah. what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They uh they both studied with Pam Chang. Oh. Yeah. I know Pam, of course. Yeah. Wow. So Pam Chang is another very well known 
Suzuki piano teacher in Seattle. She she taught at the same music school that my mom taught at. In fact, I taught at that school too for a while. There was a time in my life when I was a Suzuki violin teacher as well. Cool. Yeah, that's exciting. Wow. So so these days you're doing Irish stuff. You're doing classical gigs. Um, yeah. Do you ever do any jazz stuff too? Um, the only time I really play jazz music is um, like actual jazz music is all uh my dad does a jazz christmas concert every year at one of um the local bars in uh the wedgwood area of seattle which um, one uh wedgwood ale house yeah he does a christmas okay, con- he does like a christmas concert there every year that's kind of like the family's uh family reunion as it were too um so i'll take um i'll take silver classical flute along and i'll usually sit in on a uh, one or two of the charlie brown christmas um, oh yeah so, yeah like uh skating that's one we do yeah it sounds really cool on flute so i'll, I'll do that do yeah um and on the irish bands i play in i do a lot of that uh kind of you know i have to uh do for the accompaniment we also just like some of that traditional um indian music you were talking about earlier those musicians mm-hmm. um they have different, I mean, I remember from our rehearsal, they were doing a lot of stuff by ear for Irish music, um, gigs and playing at pubs and stuff. That's all an aural thing. We don't have any written music. So if I'm backing up uh, or playing along with a singer um, on a song, you know, I've got to you know, hear those chord changes and kind of make sure and make sure that I'm matching the melody of the song and that kind of thing. So a little, cool. bit, little bit of a uh, little bit of, not a little bit of improvisation going on there too. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of trumpet and flute, uh, you know, the Bach French suite, right? With yes. that famous badinery. I've heard, I once heard it was either on TV or on YouTube. There was this mariachi band that was doing a mariachi version of that, but the trumpet player was playing the flute part. Oh, that's something. Man, that's cool. Yeah, and it sounded really good. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah that, that, was, that was so cool. Do you think, okay, so that was something you saw on TV or was like... I've, okay. I'm sure if you looked it up on YouTube, you'd probably be able to find videos of it. Like, uh, if you looked up like Bach Mariachi or something like that. Oh, you man. Yeah, I'll look really for it. Cool. If I find it, I'll stick it down there. Awesome. It was cool because it was... It was like, I don't know if you know much about mariachi music, but a lot of times they'll take a classical piece and then they'll do a mariachi version of it. Like I've heard like versions of like the Mozart Symphony number 40. Then mariachi version and so on. That's really cool. I got to look that up. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Here's another one for you. Um, were you old enough to appreciate Jethro Tull? Uh, I got one of their CDs, yeah. <laughs> um, and my flute professor in college actually gave it to me. Um, he said it was a, the CD was a gift from someone else to him, and he said he was never going to listen to it. So, uh, <laughs> so he didn't even listen to it one time. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was, I, I've still got, I've got that album on my phone. I listened to it a couple of times here and there. Yeah, I think that, yeah, cool stuff going on. It's uh, yeah. that Ian Anderson fellow. Yeah. Killer, killer, good player. I've seen him play on YouTube and stuff too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then there, of course there is, oh boy, come on. I can do this. Who's the famous Indian flute player. Oh boy. He plays a bamboo flute. I've actually seen him live in Kane hall. In fact, yes. believe it or not, I was in the elevator with him in Kane Hall, and I didn't realize it was him until we almost got to the floor that we were supposed to get up and like, wait a minute, this is this this is the guy who's the star of the show that I'm about to go to. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and his name was oh darn it. He's a really well known Indian raga bamboo flute player. Well, I can't pull it out of my mind. Anyway. Have you they heard call, much of that kind of stuff? They call that ban, ban, bansuri. Am I saying that right? I'm not quite sure. Ban, um, bansuri, that bamboo flute, they call it a bansuri. 
Bonsuri. I Bonsuri. think Bonsuri is the name for the for the um Japanese version, isn't it? Uh that's Shakuhachi. Okay, maybe you're right. Maybe it's Bonsuri. You know, I'm gonna look it up. Hold on. Okay. Um, I okay, did look Google. up some of that. Uh I looked up some of that um because when we were doing online work um online work for COVID at the elementary school, I wanted to, you know, just show my students different um musical styles, genres from around the world. Um, so I was looking up uh traditional Indian music one time. I think I wound up going with a uh sitar and tabla thing but uh yeah definitely but yeah i ran across a few videos of that super cool yeah, um, i was really interested to see you know i'd have to go back and double check the video but it looked like there might have been some similar stuff they were doing with their fingers that we do with um irish flute so interest um so i'd like to go back and double check that see how they get those kinds of effects and what crossover might be i'm pretty sure they do the same type of stuff that you were describing we're like just half hitting the holes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then of course it's just the concept of what they're trying to do. Cause like when you listen to like Indian pop music, mm -hmm. when you listen to the flute players, they never play it straight. Mm -hmm. They're always doing some kind of ornamentation and that's what makes it sound Indian. Nice. And a lot of it's, it's a lot of it sounds kind of similar to the kind of stuff you were doing for the Irish. Um, Wow, I wish I could remember his name, darn it. Bonsuri Flute. Yeah, I'm looking it up and now it's not. Let me see. Bonsuri Flute Raga. I mean, I'm talking about the 80s and the 90s, so maybe he's not as well known anymore. But, well, anyway. Of course, Indian, in Indian, in Hindu culture, the most famous character in Hindu culture, of course, is Krishna, Sri Krishna. And he, I have a, I got this from when I was in India. You might be able to see it better against a lava lamp. Yeah. Maybe not. There we go. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah. He's got his flute. And too. he plays the flute. And the legend is, is when he plays the flute, everybody gets so entranced and all the women fall, fall madly in love with him. And then all the men are, are similarly charmed, but in a more brotherly way. Oh, I got you. I like, got you. There's some famous uh, bhajans, like there's a famous bhajan where the, the singer is pleading to Krishna. Oh, Krishna, please stop playing your flute. Please stop <laughs> playing because I have to go feed my children. <laughs> you know, I have to go tend to my husband. My family is starving, everybody, but I can't leave. If you don't stop playing your flute, I'll never be able to leave. Please stop playing your flute. Man. <laughs> How did it end? Did he? Or, uh... Well, I'm assuming he must have stopped at some point and she get, was able to go home. Gotcha. <laughs> so, yeah. And the type of type of flute he played was the bamboo flute. And they would do, they bend all these notes and you know, leave all these entrancing type of things sound so that's really cool yeah it's amazing stuff yeah, yeah. so um i had a another question in there somewhere okay yeah. of course i now i lost it oh yeah do, do you have you played like bass flute or, or alto flute Some yeah of those we have ones? We have, um, at Central Washington University, I played in flute choir most quarters I was there. I think there were only like two or three quarters that I missed. Oh. Um, so yeah, I got a chance to play, um, I got a chance to play both of those. Um, the one I really wanted to play but never got the opportunity to was the contrabass flute. That's oh, cool. the one that's made out of PVC and it looks like a giant, giant number four that you hold like this uh -huh. um almost bassoon like but bigger and you have it's like it it's so so big and you gotta put so much air into it they gotta mic it up in order to be able to hear it at all oh wow um, yeah that's the only one i didn't play when i was there but bass flute just love the sound of it um alto flute's great too um very tricky intonation but uh yeah okay. just sounds yeah for those super low flutes, what kind of mouthpiece do they use? 
Um, when I play bass flute, I think, yeah, with both of those, you know, they have it so that the mouthpiece turns over. Okay. So I think like this, except it's a U shape. Um, right. That way, you know, you're not holding it out here. You're able to have it here and the head joint wraps up to here and then you're able to play comfortably. Okay. Yep. Um, and, yeah. and is the actual mouthpiece pretty much the same as a normal flute? Or is it bigger or smaller or? A tad bit bigger um, on the bass flute. The um, bass flute, it's got these things called wings. Um, you know, regular, your standard classical flute's got the raised part around the uh, embouchure hole. Um, the bass flute has like this kind of sloped up part on it on the side for your lips to kind of jut against. Um, yeah, okay, I was going to ask yeah. you, so on a classical flute, what's the extra part supposed to do? That... Oh, that lip plate kind of thing? Yeah. Um, I think it helps focus the air certain ways and stuff like that. Um, truth be told, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think, well, yeah, so, you know, the, it's a lot more thinner. It's a lot narrower than this is, uh, you know, really tiny hole. So, or tiny cylinder. So that lip plate gives you the, um, you know, lip plate makes it more comfortable for your lips and your chin to lie on and helps you focus the sound better. So that way it's not like, it's not like one of these little uh whist like you're trying to blow into a whistle hole right here or anything like that. Okay. Okay, yeah. speaking of that, do you ever play pan flute? Um, I have one. Um Leavenworth Summer Theater. I used to play principal flute for them. Um in addition to the sound of music show, they'd uh, every summer they'd always do uh, um they'd always do other shows. And uh, they asked me to uh, come back and play um, for a musical version of The Secret Garden. Um, and that had a pan flute pipe on it, so, or a pan flute part on it. So I was able to find a, uh, I was able to find an affordable one. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't really get played much now. Um, I wasn't able to do that show um, because they canceled it uh, uh, for the year that they're going to, you know, back in 2021, before everything totally opened up, they weren't able to put that production on. Um, and then I wasn't able to go back and do it this past year because I had too many local gigs going on. Okay. Uh, but I I've experimented with it. Um, truth be told, it's not really my cup of tea. Um, just, I don't have the, I don't have the skill to like zip through it and stuff like that right. but i've seen some pretty amazing um the guy who was my resource for that showed me some pretty cool stuff i saw that botanary one i'm pretty sure i saw someone play that one time on pan flute oh wow oh man <laughs> wow that would be impressive yeah okay because it's hard enough just on normal flute yeah it's uh yeah. it goes at it yeah it can be can go at a pretty brisk trot yeah yeah well like uh i don't know if you're wherever down downtown Seattle much, but there was a group down there, the Indian Peruvian Indian guys, the Peruvians. Nice. Now, what am I saying? The Andes. Andes. Yeah. Yeah. Those guys would play pan flute. Uh, you know who I'm talking about? There was a group that would play on the street down there a lot and they would play like near Pike place. They would play a lot. And they also played at like uh, Seattle center right there on the sidewalk and they were selling their CDs and stuff. Yeah, and, I've seen them. I've seen them a couple of times. Yeah, at different festivals, they like folk life. I think. Yeah. Yeah, those guys. Yeah, yeah they're really cool. Yeah, yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Wow, I'm trying to think of any other tidbits I'd like to hit before we wrap up. So you, I think, well, you told actually you didn't say on the show, but your favorite flutist is James Galway, right? Uh, he's my favorite classical flutist. Uh, favorite okay. Irish traditional flutist is Frankie Kennedy from that group Altan I was talking about earlier. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I love, you know, James Galway, Sir James Galway, sorry. Yeah, I love his classical playing. Um, I think part of the thing I'm drawn to with flute players is unique tones. You know, Frankie Kennedy, okay. he's got this tone on Irish flute that I've never heard out of another Irish flute player before. Hmm. And same thing with Sir James Galway. Anytime, you know, listening to 98.1 King FM or anything like that, if flute yeah. playing comes up, I can always tell if it's James Galway or not. He's just got right. that unique, unique, strong sound. Just you can always tell it's Sir James Galway. And that's what I really love about his playing. Yeah, it's really solid. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Have you tried to figure out how to imitate that sound? 
Uh, well, I got lucky. I got into a master class with him um, over in Italy back in fall 2016. Uh -huh. um, so I got to go over there. And one of the things we talked about was tone. So he helped me out with a little bit of that stuff. Uh, so okay. I got to study some tone stuff with him firsthand. Okay. Um, of course, never going to be able to sound entirely like that. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely I think part of what's so unique about his style is his vibrato. So try mm -hmm. to listen to that. Um, yeah, vibrato is definitely a big part of it, but yeah, I was able to, uh, talk with him a little bit and see how he was doing. He let me try one of his flutes too, which was really cool. So that's cool. Oh, that golden flute that he has, he let you play. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's got like 20 golden flutes now, oh. you know, it's like, you know, flute makers make them for him. Cause you know, it's a big deal if you can say James Galway plays on your flute. Right. So, right. yeah. So, um, yeah, he had a, uh, I think he had some, so I think he had a Muramatsu when I was there. Yeah, he had like a 14 karat gold Muramatsu for that master class, I think. Yeah. It was just gold plated, right? It wasn't solid gold, was it? No, it was so it was solid gold. Whoa, that must have been expensive. Yeah, I was like scared when he handed it to me. You know, he's like, here, get this one to spin. <laughs> like, Don't and, drop like, it. He had, to, he had to like coach me into uh, playing it. You know, I just was like looking at this thing in awe. I was like, oh, man. He's like, yeah, go ahead. Get, get Go ahead. Play on it. Get a tone. Get a sound. Like, all right. All right. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Man. Okay. So I wonder, did he talk about how he developed his tone? Did he, How did he arrive at it? Just, just natural to him? Or did he really work at it to try and create the Galway sound? Uh, he really worked at it. Um, he had a book, this one right here. His flute teacher, when he was growing up, really made him study a lot out of this one. This is um, the De La Sonorite um, on Sonority and Art by, um, yeah, by Marcel Moyes. He was like the king of the uh, French flute school okay. um, way back. But yeah, he, uh, but yeah, so this was the book that James, uh, Sir James Galway got, um, did a lot of exercises out of. Hmm. Um, I try to make sure I practice a little bit out of it every time I play the flute and stuff. So that's yeah. like scales and stuff or what, what's in that book? Tone stuff. Um, you know, like it, uh, tells you, it gives you a description of different things to think about, but a lot of it is you're setting the metronome at 60 clicks and then just slowly moving from note to note and then gradually building up how many notes you go from in a row. Like, yeah, da. Da, 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 da. and then you just keep building on that over and over again so yeah and, and then there's there's the, stuff about uh there's stuff about like uh um like dynamics and stuff like that in there like yeah hold each of these for like four you know four beats grow the tone and stuff like that and do them as a series so yeah huh yeah and that's both like that's just developing breath control is that what you're doing? Uh, lip embouchure control. Oh. Yeah. You okay. know, how your lips are positioned over the uh, embouchure hole and stuff like that. Huh. Wow. Yeah. That's wild stuff. Yeah. Okay. Do you, like, for your kids in, uh, in elementary school, do you ever get to that level with them? Um, I teach general music, um, so I don't do band or orchestra um but i'll occasionally Yet. pull out of, yeah i'll occasionally okay. pull out a flute I'll, I'll occasionally pull out a few students and work with them on flute stuff um at that age generally try to steer clear of that sort of like slow playing and stuff because like you know they're you, you lose their interest awfully quick okay. uh, when you're telling them to do that kind of stuff it's like okay you know it's like the choice the choice between like playing you know jingle bells or uh happy birthday or something like that as opposed to sitting there just going yeah da, yeah, yeah da, <laughs> you know it's a, yeah. right it's a it's a tough sell yeah we'll put it that way it's a tough sell okay yeah. and you're talking like third graders or how old are these kids uh fifth fifth and sixth grade oh okay. uh, Edmonds, yeah the school district i teach in we're one of the only districts that goes all the way through sixth grade wow yeah so do they have a band, sixth grade band then? They do. We have sixth grade band. We have sixth grade orchestra. Uh, Bobby Collins actually teaches orchestra. Oh, Bobby, okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So you can send your superstars over to him. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Send him the orchestra. Super yeah. He does all the string stuff. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot. These days, orchestras are all strings, and uh, then just, oh, the yeah. winds go to band. Okay. Yep. Ah, cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, what else should we uh, talk about before we I let you go? Like, is there any other gigs you got coming up, or actually, what's the name of your band? Do they have a website or a YouTube channel or something like that? Yeah, main band I plan is called Cavort Celtic, and I'll send you the uh, the link to their webpage after this match. Um, and we've got two gigs. Yeah, we'll make sure it gets down there in the bottom. Link we've the got two gigs. We've got two gigs this Saturday, um, September 17th, because, you know, it's halfway to St. Patrick's Day okay. um, on Saturday, September 17th. So we're going to be playing at the Blarney Stone Pub in downtown Seattle at 2 o'clock. Okay. And then um, later that afternoon, um, as soon as we get done with that gig at around 7-ish, I want to say we're going to be playing at, uh, I think it's 7, it's either 6 or 7, I'd have to double check, but, you know, you'll be able to find it on the band's website. Okay. Um, at six or seven, we'll be, then be playing at a pub called Cared um, over there um, on Lower Queen Anne Hill. Um, but, okay. Yeah, that's so. Uh, that's on Saturday, seventeenth, um, and we've got gigs down in. We got a gig in Centralia um, at the McMenamins down there the Saturday after that, and we'll be playing again that night um, in Gig Harbor. That'll be Saturday the twenty fourth. Um, and then in October, um, I'm going to be traveling to the Ocean Shores um, oh, Golden Bay Celtic Festival. And I'll be playing with a more of a uh, rock sort of style band there called um, Star Craving Plaid. Um, and as part of the festival, I'll be teaching fl um, Irish flute and Irish whistle workshops. Oh, so cool. if, you're interested in learn if you're interested in learning more about, um, if you're interested in learning more about Irish flute and whistle or just getting started on that or anything like that, I'll be at the ocean shores festival, um, teaching workshop down there. So you can, uh, yeah, find. So if you're in that Oregon area, feel free to come by stuff and say hi and stuff. Cool. Yep. All right. That's fun. Yeah. All right, sir. All right. Let's sign off. Uh, I don't, are you a star Trek type of a person? You ever watch star Trek? I gotta be honest, Matt, more inclined towards Star Wars, you know, uh, sorry to say, but uh, I do appreciate Star Trek. Um, grew up watching some of the original is. stuff. Oh, yeah, that's Live Long and Prosper. Yeah. All right, there we go. So let's do it. The Star Trek salute. Live that's Long good. and Prosper, sir. Live Long and Prosper. Shall Thanks we meet again in our next gig? <laughs> Indeed. This was fun. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate you. Uh, yeah, appreciate your questions, letting me talk a little bit about Irish flute and some of the gig stuff coming up. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Take care, Alec. everywhere we gotta change